I'm Greg Brown. I was chief preparator at the University of Nebraska State Museum for 35 years. Recently uh, sort of retired, but um, I, love, uh, I love this work and uh, I don't think I'll ever actually get away from it. So I'm back to talk about um, conservation principles and ethics. And you're gonna hear a lot about conservation throughout this talk, you already have, or throughout this uh, conference, because conservation principles actually underlie almost everything that we do. So uh, a lot of this will be redundant, a lot will be expanded upon in other talks. Here again are the essential competencies. Um, conservation principles and ethics is number six. To understand conservation principles and ethics, um, you have to realize that uh, this, this, is the, this is the statement in the uh, essential competencies. The preparator is also a conservator and makes every effort to ensure that the prepared specimen will resist deterioration as long as possible. The qualified preparator recognizes the agents of deterioration and understands the principles of preventive and remedial conservation. Preparator is familiar with the current literature, principles, ethics, and specialized vocabulary, vocabulary of conservation. So first we're gonna talk about ethics a little bit, and, and um, every organization has ethics statements. Um, the dictionary definition is pretty close to uh, how it applies to our organization and others. It's a system of moral principles, the ethics of culture, the rules of conduct recognized in respect to a particular class of human actions or a particular group, culture, etc., medical ethics, Christian ethics, conservation ethics, which is my addition to the definition in the dictionary, moral principles as an, of an individual, his ethics forbade betrayal of confidence. That doesn't so much apply, I guess. The branch of philosophy dealing with values relating to human conduct with respect to the rightness and wrongness of certain actions and the goodness and badness of the motives and ends of such actions. That actually applies pretty well to what we do. Here's some examples. Um, probably the best example is from the uh, American Institute for Conservation. Um, and I think Matt touched on these. Um, the conservation professional shall strive to attain the highest possible standards in all aspects of conservation, including but not limited to preventive conservation, examination, documentation, treatment, research, and education. Uh, conservation professionals shall practice within the limits of personal, personal competence and education as well as within the limits of available facilities. This is really important when you're dealing with underfunded facilities. Conservation, conservation professional must strive to select methods and materials that to the best of current knowledge do not adversely affect the cultural property, or in this case, the paleontological property, or its future examination, scientific investigation, treatment, or function. Um, shall document examination, scientific investigation, and treatment by creating permanent records and reports shall recognize a responsibility for preventive conservation by endeavoring to limit damage or deterioration to cultural property, providing guidelines for continued, continuing use and care, recommending appropriate environmental conditions for storage and exhibit, and encouraging proper procedures for handling, packing, and transport. And finally, um, the conservation professional shall contribute to the evolution and growth of the profession, which is what we are all here to do. Another relevant example is from our own ethics statement. Uh, you've probably all read that and, and I'll leave it to you to read. Uh, but the highlighted portion is all actions of the members should be informed by respect for the specimens in their care and members will strive to make informed decisions based on the best current knowledge to select materials and methods that do not adversely affect the specimen or its possibilities for future research. And as Matt showed you, the only statement in the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology uh, is that fossil vertebrate speci specimens should be prepared by or under the supervision of trained personnel. There's another section there that does mention conservation, uh, but it's mostly uh, dealing with uh, 
the deposition of specimens into a, a, a facility that uh, values conservation and, and preservation and perpetuity of specimens. Bottom line, it is our ethical, moral, and pragmatic responsibility to provide a framework that informs our decisions with regard to the collection, preparation, preservation, and use of the fossils in our collections. Conservation principles form the foundation of this framework. So why do you do what you do? You make decisions all the time. The qualities of a competent preparator are the ability to constantly analyze a situation and adapt to make an almost infinite series of major and minor decisions that result in a desired outcome. Well, in our case, what is the desired outcome and how the heck do you make these decisions? It's nice to have good hands, but most of the important stuff actually happens in your head. Desired outcome for most of our prep work is uh, revelation and preservation of the specimen. We reveal it and we attempt to preserve it for future research with minimal damage and loss of data. What do you base these decisions on? Decisions are always knowledge-based. There are a lot of places we get our knowledge, publications, conference presentations and workshops, word of mouth, on-the-job training, personal experimentation, personal experience. Each of these sources has its own pitfalls. This is from a discussion list. It's a, it's a hobbyist discussion list, so um, you have to take everything with a little grain of salt sometimes. But um, I'm looking for an adhesive to use to glue together some fossilized whalebone fragments. Also, I'm looking for some kind of hardening agent for use in preserving bone fragments. Does anyone have any suggestions? How about other internet sites that might have the answer? This is the mindset that there is an answer. I don't have to understand how I arrive at that answer, but somebody can tell me the answer. So you've probably already read the answer, maybe. Elmer's white glue works fine and is water soluble, so it can be redone. You can also use butvar, <coughs> butvar which can be mixed in varying, varying consistencies. However, using acetone as a solvent has obvious disadvantages. Most of the people in my club use Elmer's, occasionally super glue for tough cases. You can also grind up bone fragments and mix them with Elmer's to make a filler. Now, I, I don't see too many things in there that I would actually do. And, and the question becomes, um, what do you pay attention to? Always question a what answer to your questions. Always question a what answer if it doesn't come with a why. Okay, that's the, sort of an underlying theme that I'll probably use a little bit here. How do you judge? Publications. I'm sure that most of you here have uh, the, uh, the Paleo Techniques volume by Feldman, Chapman, and Hannibal editors. Um, there's a chapter 27, glues and other stickums and patchums, stabilizing compounds for strengthening fossils. There's another article in the Legi and May volume on vertebrate paleontological techniques. Uh, chapter two, an evaluation of adhesives and consolidants recommended for fossil vertebrates. If you have access to those, read them, and you decide uh, which paper is the one that you should place your faith in. Again, if there are no whys, you probably don't want to pay too much attention to it. Whys are important. If you don't have those papers, um, drop me an email. It should be in the program somewhere. Um, and I'll send you copies of it, of those uh, papers. And um, if it was a test, the entire, the entire conference, the test would be which of those is the right paper to pay attention to. The decisions a preparator makes uh, by the sheer variety of problems we faced are best described as informed, inventive actions. Appropriate decisions derive from a knowledge of underlying conservation principles, the whys, not simply from a compendium of what and how. So here is uh, the relationship between preparation, conservation, and restoration, which are the three main functions that we, we do as preparators. And um, I don't know how I came across this cartoon, but it just popped up on my screen. 
So again, the preparator's responsibilities in the, in the field, in the lab, are preparation, preventive conservation, remedial conservation, otherwise called treatment in some literature, and restoration. Um, preparation, as we know, we all do it. It develops an object for scientific or display use. You're attempting to reveal data for the researcher. It's intended to enhance the scientific or display value of the specimen. All preparation techniques, I would not say may cause damage. All preparation techniques actually do cause damage and data loss in the simple act of revealing the specimen. What's conservation? Conservation principles dictate that we attempt to ensure the stability of an object with the minimum level of intervention and alteration of the object itself. Where innovation is required, the materials and techniques used should be suitable, stable, and reversible to the extent possible. They should alter the original nature of the object to the minimum extent possible. There are two subsets of conservation, falls into two primary categories, preventive conservation and remedial conservation, again, and also called treatment. Preventive conservation is proactive. It controls the environmental factors influencing the stability of the object. It's non-intrusive and non-altering to the object. It addresses the agents of deterioration, which if you're not familiar with, we're gonna cover here in detail in just a moment. Preserves maximum data and includes variables met during the collection, transportation, storage, handling, display, everything that a fossil encounters. Remedial conservation, the second category, is reactive. It addresses existing or impending damage or susceptibility to deterioration that cannot be mitigated using the preventive conservation techniques. It's often intrusive. Altering treatments performed on the specimen includes consolidation, adhesion, and other specific treatments. Any remedial treatment of a specimen will limit the utility of the specimen for future research. There will be data loss or data obfuscation. You like that? That's a good one. <laughs> the other thing we do in the lab typically, because we all work for institutions that display specimens, is restoration. Restoration has nothing to do with the science of preserving a specimen. It's intended to enhance the aesthetic appearance of, or approximate the original form of a specimen. Restoration may cover scientific data, damage the specimen, or be incorrect and misleading. While many preparators may not realize it, and most do not have formal conservation training, again, we, routine, we routinely perform all of these functions. How we prepare and care for the specimens should be dictated by its intended use and value, whether scientific, educational, or for display, and by applicable principles of conservation. Now, a little detail about uh, preventive conservation. We have to recognize that all objects are in a continual state of deterioration. The only thing that really differs is the rate at which they are deteriorating. We cannot stop deterioration. We can only alter its rate. The goal of preventive conservation is to avoid, block, or minimize the effects of the soon-to-be-discussed agents of deterioration. Now, I used to refer to fossils as inherently unstable objects, but I realized the folly of my way because these things have been preserved in the ground for millions of years. Are they really inherently unstable? They are not. An object is stable if it's in equilibrium with its environment, with its surroundings. And as long as that fossil is in the ground um, and not exposed to various agents of deterioration, it's stable. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it. The fact that, a what I just said, I won't read it. Uh, removing it from its buried environment, either naturally by erosion or humanly by a paleontologist, removes it from equilibrium and exposes it to the agents of deterioration. So what are these agents of deterioration? There are anywhere from nine to 11, depending on whose publication you read. But essentially, 
We're talking about direct physical forces, displacers, vandals, institutional neglect, fire, water, pests, contaminants, radiation, incorrect temperature, and incorrect relative humidity. These are, these are the only ways that specimens deteriorate. <laughs> Connie, Connie, I forgot, I forgot the bar across your face so people wouldn't recognize you. <laughs> Agents of deterioration can be cumulative or catastrophic, and they inv involve such things as vibration, shock, abrasion, gravity, drawer wear, improper handling, or support. I have to say, if you haven't seen this picture of Connie before, it's not real. It's it's a practical joke on her boss. <laughs> Displacers, vandals, and neglect, intentional criminals or unintentional users and staff. Um, we probably don't have the time to read this letter, but this was a return on the right as a return of loan. Oh. On the left, and without any packaging removed, thank you very much. Um, and uh, on the left is uh, a researcher's work area. <laughs> so you can see how things might get displaced or damaged. Fire and water are pretty straightforward. It, in, it more involves the uh, buildings, physical plant, and maybe the location where the building is more than anything you can do in your collections other than generally accepted housekeeping. Um, there's an institutional responsibility to provide suitable safeguards. And location plays a big part. If your museum's in the New Orleans Delta or in Colorado Springs surrounded by pine forests, your exposure to potential hazards of fire and water are pretty obvious. Pests. We usually don't think of pests as destroying fossils. I don't think there are too many bugs that uh, process fossil bones other than certain termites, but they destroy data. Uh, they contaminate specimens. Um, bug poop is not just disgusting stuff, it's a chemical. And it can actually interact with the specimen itself. Uh, silverfish love to chew on paper. Contaminants. Contaminants include things we don't normally think of as contaminants, like oxygen uh, and, and off-gassing of uh, collection furnishings, cabinets, things like that. Radiation. There are lots of forms of radiation. The one we're most uh, particularly interested in is light, visible light, uh, UV. It can accelerate deterioration of some minerals, and fossils are minerals, mineral composites generally, can destroy documentation. Light also acts on the objects as well as any materials added to the objects, like consolidants and adhesives. That's a very important thing to remember. Incorrect temperature, incorrect relative humidity, they usually go hand in hand. Some things are more susceptible to one or the other. The, uh, the trace down here, this is a, this is a uh, hydrothermograph reading from uh, ash fall fossil beds when it had very mediocre enclosure to protect the specimens that were left in situ. This is actually the humidity trace. When the doors are closed at the end of the day here, the humidity increases because we're getting moisture from the ground and it's being trapped in the building. It's open to ambient conditions here fairly stable, then, well, let me see, when am I reading this right? Um, yep, doors close, humidity goes up, it stabilizes at a very really high rate, doors are open in the morning, humidity drops, and you go through that cycle over and over, and the temperature cycle sort of follows that. Uh, incorrect temperature and humidity levels can be too high, too low, or uh, too rapid a fluctuation. Now this is, I've included one, one chart here that uh, uh, Rob Waller uh, put together for a workshop we had several years ago. You can do this same sort of a, a flow chart for every um, 
uh, agent, of agent of deterioration, and I know you can't read it from back there, but uh, incorrect relative humidity is what this whole chart does. It can be above a preferred level, below a critical threshold, changes, uh, and these are all the things uh, too large and rapid. Um, well, I can't even read it. Um, here we have, here we have um, tooth and tusks, and through below a critical threshold, uh, brittle biocomposites can react so that uh, tusks and, and teeth can, can undergo damage. So I'm, I'm not putting this up to fully discuss this, but just to show how complex the interrelations between the, the uh, agents of deterioration and the specimens can be. Incorrect relative humidity, pyrite decay. Some of you have had to deal with this, some not, luckily. Uh, and, and basically, without going into a lot of detail, because I only have eight minutes left and nine slides, um, in the presence of oxygen, pyrite undergoes a chemical reaction. It goes from iron sulfite uh, plus three, uh, well, we won't worry about the, other, the, the numbers, but oxygen yields uh, iron sulfate and uh, uh, sulfur dioxide. This is tarnish. Not particularly unstable to a specimen, but when you include water, and again, I've taken all the, if you're a chemist, this is not an accurate depiction, so I apologize. And if you are a chemist, my condolences. Um, <laughs> but in the presence of oxygen plus water, moisture, you get, um, um, iron sulfate plus water plus hydrogen sulfate plus sulfuric acid, yes, which is hydrogen sulfate, thank you. Sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid is the thing that's going to react and uh, cause problems in your collection. But the big thing that causes stuff like this is the fact that at 57% relative humidity, the uh, decay products of this pyrite uh, reaction uh, change their hydration state. And when you absorb four more molecules of water, it changes the dimensions. So yes, this is pyrite decay, but it's a hydration state changes, change that blows it all up. That was more detail that I wanted to talk about there. Levels of control to apply preventive, uh, preventive conservation strategies. You start outside with your location, New Orleans, Colorado Springs, particular site, are you in the river valley, are you on top of a mountain, building, room, cabinet, and specimen. Uh, you're controlling various parts of the environment. Um, probably the least expensive is to control the cabinet and specimen. Uh, you start into building control, and you're really not addressing the individual needs of a specimen. You're, in, you're, you're addressing human needs and the general needs of, of a museum collection, which aren't suitable for a lot of things. Okay, back on track. Summary for preventive conservation. Your role in applying or preventive conservation is to de detect, identify, document, and avoid or block the agents of deterioration, far superior than trying to modify the object to resist these agents of deterioration. You're modifying a specimen's environment rather than the specimen itself, and it's most applicable to specimen storage, handling, uh, minimizing long-term damage and data loss. As far as remedial con uh, conservation is concerned, a lot of the things we actually do to fossils would fall under this category. Uh, treatments performed on the specimens themselves, usually alterative and usually selectively preserve only a subset of the available data. You're preparing the fossil to reveal certain aspects of its morphology or whatever the researcher is trying to get at, at the expense of others. The guiding principles, again, minimum intervention and modification of the specimen, maximum reversibility. Most of those treatments are intended to stabilize or report, repair existing damage. Appropriate only if preventive conservation strategies are not sufficient, not a substitute for preventive conservation, 
and should be compatible with the intended use of the specimen. Remedial conservation again, um, uh, to stabilize or repair damaged fossils, to impart or maintain physical integrity, often involves adhesives and consolidants. When you're looking at adhesives and consolidants, you have to consider several things. Is there a need? Is there actually a need to consolidate a specimen? We used to consolidate everything. But more times than not, it's not necessary. You preserve the maximum amount of data. If you do choose an adhesive or a consolidant, you want to choose a material that's stable uh, over time under the prevailing conditions in your, in your collections or on display. Or does it yellow, shrink, cross-link, and brittle, et cetera? Reversibility is the, is the material easily reversed. Can bonds be easily and safely removed? The term reversibility and conservation usually means can it be removed, leaving no trace behind. That is not a practical uh, definition for what we do. So we tend to think of reversibility more as undoing what we've done. We've glued a join. Uh, do we want to remove that? Is it possible to remove that join or take it apart again? Glass transition temperature. Um, all I'll say about that right now is that uh, any polymer that you uh, use on fossils has a glass transition temperature, and that's a temperature at which the, the polymer is transitioning from a solid to a liquid. It's behaving more like uh, a glass, which is a very viscous liquid. If you reach the glass transition temperature of a polymer, if you're using it as an adhesive, it can flow. The join can just basically bend if it's not, the specimen's not uh, supported properly. Um, it can entrain dust. You've all seen shellac fossils that are now covered with shellac and dust. Shellac has a notoriously low glass transition temperature. And strength. Ideally, um, adhesives should be weaker than the materials they bond. Cohesive failure, where the, where the adhesive fails within the adhesive itself, is far preferred to adhesive failure or object failure, where the adhesive pulls away from the specimen or the specimen fails. So a lot of times people think, well, I need a really strong adhesive. Well, you probably don't. Adhesive joins really should not rely on the adhesive itself uh, to prevent failure. That's where supporting structures, uh, which you'll hear about more here in a, in a short time, uh, come in. Remedial conservation and technique selection. I think all the things we do with our tools to expose a fossil, um, while not conservation treatments per se, uh, we should consider our choice of tools and techniques uh, to reflect conservation principles. Um, I think uh, the main thing is don't use a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. Don't use acid prep if it's not necessary. All tools and all techniques have a range of potential damage they can do to a specimen. You want to use the one that has the least potential to cause damage and loss of data. And finally, expediency is not a valid reason to abandon good conservation principles. I have a sign, I had a sign on my door, maybe it's still on Carrie's door since she replaced me, that says, if you want it bad, you get it bad. <laughs> and uh, so, curators beware. Documentation, um, I've got about 30 seconds left, so I'll just go through this real fast. Um, we need to document what we do to specimens, provides feedback on treatment efficacy, uh, it guides subsequent treatment choices, uh, provides a framework for validation of research observations, and provides a way to assess future deterioration. Um, well, we did drop one picture, Matt. That's the only thing. So summary, uh, the least interventive treatments should be considered first. Proactive, preventive conservation should always be the priority option. Every treatment we perform should be done for a specific reason or purpose, taking into consideration good conservation principles, the properties of the object and the materials used, the needs of the specimen and the ultimate best use of the specimen. 
While often necessary in our line of work, all remedial treatments damage the specimen and destroy information. Sometimes we need to do that to preserve the specimen itself, obviously. Preparators should employ a conservation-minded approach to every preparation project. And I think that's it. Thank you very much.